السلام عليكم everybody بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد uh, so it's really interesting to talk about female companions in the month of Ramadan because something that has become the Rabata habit is every year we do the educational fundraiser and we highlight one of the women around the Prophet Sallallahu and this last year we did a shifa which was just serendipitous subhanallah like I was like let's choose someone nobody knows you know, and um, we did Ashifa, and subhanAllah, how much did the community need to learn from Ashifa, just her name and what it means, what it means the cure. And this year, we chose Fatima Zahra. And subhanAllah, one of my goals in my personal learning about the women around the Prophet Sallam, and then my teaching about them is really to okay, hear me out, it's to plump them up. <laughs> So what I mean by that is that very often we are taught about these women in a very two-dimensional manner. We learn about the women around the Prophet Sallam, whether it is the Ummahat and Mu'minin we're talking about, or some of the other more famous female companions, we learn about them in a very sort of flat way. What I mean by that is if you think about literature in grade seven or grade six, when you study, when you're first learning creative writing and your teacher told you, make the characters three-dimensional. So in other words, make them full, like make them so they feel like real people so people will enjoy the story. Now, of course, that's about fiction writing, but it, it, it is really what I mean here that, it, well, hang on, it, what, it meant, what I mean by this is that there is no human being that is two-dimensional. It's just not, it just isn't. Every human being is three-dimensional in their human self, in their human, in who they are. And because we've learned so much of what we've, we've learned about the women around the Prophet Sallam has been two-dimensional, I feel like we are not as enriched by their lives as we often are by the men around the Prophet Sallam. Mm -hmm. And so the men's lives seems to have been developed more for many reasons. There's no reason to be upset about that. It just is what it is. Historically, that is the type of history that was written. That is the type of history that was passed down across geographical borders. We're actually really blessed that we have so much information about early women and the foundational women, or as Mary Amir calls them, the foremothers of our, of our faith and of our religion. We're really blessed to have that information. So we can go back, study it, and pump out that, that rhetoric so that we can all, it can help us understand these women better. And I, before I launch into talking about Fatima herself, I also want to say that whenever we study the women around the Prophet Sallam, I want to invite the audience to remember that it, for those of you who are women in the audience, to remember that, yes, we want to see ourselves in them. Just as we've been taught for so many years to see ourselves in Abu Bakr, Umar, anhuma, et cetera, Osman Ali, anhuma, et cetera. But also, men need to, and men and our sons need to see themselves in the women around the Prophet Because they are all companions of Rasulullah. And each one teaches us something really important about how to live and how to be a modern companion. One of my friends, actually one of my co-translators for the Sira book, she asks, she poses the question in a really good lecture that she gives. She poses the question, can we be the Sahabiyat of this time? Can we be? And it's a, for her, it's a serious question with, without a sort of simple answer of, sure or no like either one of those is not okay is we really we have to think deeply about whether or not we actually can be the companions of this time i would my you know me like the way i jump on things i would say it's absolutely necessary but the question is how to do that that's my answer whenever she talks about that but but i mean i think it's really important for us to recognize here in this space that all of the people around the Prophet I send them are examples for all of the people today and before and coming to the future. So that being said, when I'm talking about Fatima and Zahra, I am definitely in the space of as women, we want to see ourselves around the Prophet I send them, so we want to see that example. But I'm also in the space of here is a lover of Allah. Here is a companion of Rasulullah. Here is the daughter of Rasulullah. Here is a woman who has been elevated and we've been told that she is of the best of women. So we need to really push the pause button on that and understand it. 
much more than what we've heard uh, quite often in chutzpahs and such, which have been um, such things like, she was a good one. Now, mind you, we want good families. We want healthy families. We all want to be good in our roles and our life. So don't mishear me of, of discrediting that in any way. But again, that's that two-dimensional. She was a full human being with, and, and it's that full human being that made her of the best of women. You don't become of the best of women because you're two-dimensional. And I, for all of us, we need to know this so that we can all grow into our full three-dimensional selves that will please Allah Okay, Sorry, that was a really long introduction, but just so we can be in this space of who was she? So Fatima al-Zahra, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. Very, let's start with just some simple biographical details. She was born to her mother, Khadija. Uh, may Allah be pleased with her, who was an older mother. And her father, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, barakatuh, Sayyidina Muhammad, but he was not yet a prophet at the birth of Fatima, radiallahu anha. She was, I believe, five years old when the revelation began. So, it was really early on in her life that she begins the, the, the path of being the daughter of a prophet. This is something really to think about there because I know that whenever you are a child of a strong parent in whatever field they happen to be in, there's a certain pressure that sometimes happens and a certain reflection of the self that sometimes causes a child to say, okay, I wanna be over here because I feel too overshadowed in this space. And Fatima radiallahu anha, we never ever see any of that from her, but let's just finish biographical details first. She will grow and in, at about the age of uh, 12 or 13, she'll go on Hijra and she'll go to Medina. And in Medina, and Hijra is a difficult thing. It's a, it's, I'll, I'll circle back to that in a moment. In, in, in um, Medina, now, she will live and grow as well and witness the battles that are so famous, the stress of the community that some of us know more about, and but we know there was a lot of stress in community. And then eventually, she will marry, and she will marry Ali, radiallahu anhu, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, of course. We, this is the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's Cousin. Oh, English. Cousin, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and, uh, but the Prophet was particular about who she married. It, it, it really, there were others who asked for her hand, and he was waiting uh, for Ali. But, and, and not only that, when, when Ali asked for her hand and they talked about the dowry, the mahab, the Prophet he said, I don't have, Ali said, radiallahu anhu said, I don't have anything. And the Prophet said, what of the armor that I gave you? So there was, the Prophet certainly insisted that Fatima radiallahu anha have the, the important aspects of what it means to become a wife as far as to feel stable and to feel secure in that relationship and in that marriage. And then she will eventually, of course, have her have children. Three of them will be very close to each other. She also has another son who dies, but um, so she has these children and then uh, her, of course, during that time, during this lifespan, she loses her sisters, she loses her mother, and she will also lose her father, and then she herself will pass. Okay, so that's just some really quick biographical details. The, when her name, uh, Fatima, Zahra, Fatima comes from, okay, sorry, pause, put that on the shelf, I'm going to come back to what her name means in a minute. I want to just say one more thing that I wanted to say in the introduction, but I forgot to say it. And which is that one of the things that happens to me when we do a person, Ramata, as a, as a person that we want to, to highlight is I go really deeply into thinking of, about what are their qualities. And I do that because we need categories. Like that's actually a really pragmatic, practical reason, but we want categories to award people. We want to say, mashallah, you are really good at this thing that represents the companion, this particular woman companion, mm. because it's really difficult in our day and age to say, here's a person who represents all the qualities of a certain person. Although we do strive for that, I'll explain that in a minute. But so the categories I, we thought of together, I, I can't take full credit for this, but the categories that we thought of 
I want to mention them so that as I speak about Fatima and the things we can learn about her, we can see these different qualities in her and the different aspects of her life. So we see her as a hero. What is a hero? A hero is a person who does extraordinary things in extraordinary times. And we see her as, and she's also was a humanitarian. I have to look at my little list here. She was a very much of a hard worker. Uh, of the Qanitat, which is a person who's really devout. So again, we're plumping her up, right? We're seeing the qualities. Um, she was a humanitarian. So what is a humanitarian? A person who really notices people and cares about them and finds ways to help them and assist them. Today, we say in community work, we can say that for her as well. Uh, we Think about the father-daughter duo of the Prophet and Fatima and just think about that particular relationship and how things that can happen when fathers and daughters have really healthy relationships. And um, Dhatirat, she was certainly of the Dhatirat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Dhatirin ismuha kathirin wa Dhatirat. So Dhatirat, those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. And um, she was altruistic. Altruistic means a person who is uh, not attached to this world, a person who really isn't rooted in this world. She was a caregiver. She, we see her with caring for the people in her life, the family members of her life in real concrete ways. And she had a very deep love for the Prophet Sallallahu which is not something that we want to step aside from just because she was his daughter. Remember what I said earlier, very often if you have a strong parent, you love them, but it's really difficult to kind of find your way in that shadow. And for Fatima, there was no shadow, there was only light. She not only found her way, she was there was a deep love between her and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, that extended beyond the father-daughter love, which was very important and very real. It extended beyond that to something that we can and should imitate, which is the love of a person who knows who this man is. Mm. And the final category, which of course, because of Rabata that we have, is called positive cultural change agent. But whenever I say positive cultural change, change agent, I always think, that's the category that we're trying to summarize the person in. Because I really see each of these companions. They, they walked into their cultures, whatever they were, and they said, let's see what is here and let's make it for Allah. Let's make it for deen. Let's make it something that is healthy and make it something that will work for the, for, for the people that are here and going forward. Okay, so those are the, I want you to think of those as we start to plump out uh, Baltimore and Dilla Hanha. Now I'll get to her name. So what made her so great that the Prophet Sallallahu tells us she's of the best of women? The best of women. That's a, that's a big, that's a big statement. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you look at what her name means, Baltimore. It comes from actually a word that means to be weaned. So if you're thinking about nursing your child, and, uh, the, the, and so you're nursing a baby, and what happens once that baby reaches a certain age? We all do it at different ages. I don't think I should tell you when I wean some of my kids because it was so late. Some of you might be like, uh, what? But anyway, um, at, my daughter was two years old on the dot. Like she was two years old, and I told her, listen, it's a rule. <laughs> she didn't ask me who's rule but I said it's a rule that when you turn to there's no more nursing and she looked at me with these big sad eyes she said okay of course that was my first child so I was all about the rules by the time I had the baby I was like whatever you know? <laughs> I don't, but but the but that everyone's experienced it whether the baby was three months or six months or nine months or ten months unless you weren't able to nurse and then you experienced it with weaning from a bottle or weaning from something else. This idea that the child was really um, in need of something in more ways than one. Like by the time Esma was weaned, it wasn't she wasn't dependent on nursing for food. I mean, she could she was eating M and M cookies and not too much salad. I tried, but she wasn't a big salad kid. But, you know, <laughs> all the different foods that the mother tries to get her kid to eat. It wasn't for that. It was my it's called me. It's okay. Subhanallah. Oh, subhanallah. Um anyway, so uh so the um 
Sorry, I got distracted from that. All right, so so this concept of weaning, I want to also plug my sister-in-law, Anson Sosa Nanyazi. She has a really wonderful article about this where she talks about the the name Baltima and that it means we to be weaned or she uses the word restraint. So I uh, later on, we'll send you the link. I see the, the chat is off, so... We'll send you the link so you can post it if you like. But if anyone wants to look it up, it's at her website is called Peace Spective. And then search on there for Fatima's, the Fatima article. But the, so this article really is good in that it really presents this idea, which I want to elaborate on a little bit here, which is this concept and idea that, that weaning is restraint. She, her name means to be weaned. And let's go back to that baby a minute so we can really settle for a moment in understanding what this means. Again, the child who is who is attached to nursing is weaned away from it, is pulled away from it so that, why? So they can live a life not, not in, not dependent, not dependent on nursing or whatever it is. And we can talk about this in anything else. That the, the, problem of needing something in this life is a problem of having a block or a wall between us and reaching our spiritual goals. Mm. When we see Fatima, her name means to be weaned, but she also in her life, she was weaned from all the things that we might find ourselves in need of, what we call ourselves in need of. So first, she didn't have a private family. She, she was weaned from, from having a private family. The second her father, uh, became the prophet, it was not a private family. It was people and the responsibility, the heavy responsibility. And her mother was on that path. I mean, there, it was not her father doing a job and her mother's uninterested in that. Astaghfirullah. This was a family that was on this path of this work with high goals, which meant that she had to be weaned of her personal needs. It wasn't all about Fatima anymore, even though she was young. So that it's, she was weaned from this. She was also at a very early age, weaned from safety, a feeling of safety. Think that she was at the Kaaba when her father in prostration, along with Sadi Sambarakali, in prostration, had the innards of a camel, the, the, amniotic, the amniotic fluid bag of a camel, by the way, is really gross. You can Google it. It's so gross. It's like an actual, it's not like a, a human one where it just disappears. Like it's a thick, gross, fibrous thing. And this, along with all the other afterbirth stuff, was thrown on her father. And she saw this danger. Yes, she stamped her foot. Yes, we talk about her bravery, but let's also note that she was weaned from the feeling of safety, something that many of us find very difficult to have just a little bit of feeling of not safety. We start to question all sorts of things. Should I pray in public? Should I tell people I'm fasting? Should I wear hijab? Should I, should I let people know I'm a Muslim? Should I, should I, should I, should I, should I live in this country? Should I move? Should I go out? Should I this? Should I that? Should I go to the mosque? It just a little bit of that feeling really makes us really have a lot of anxiety and unstable. Baltimore was weaned from the feeling of safety at a very early age. As we walk forward in her life, remembering those details I mentioned, she was weaned from her home. She would, she, the child, her childhood home, she had to leave and go to a whole new city where, I mean, I know for us, we think Mecca, Medina, what's the big difference? But it, the smells of the city were different. The full culture of the city was different. One was a business merchant centered city. The other was a city centered around uh, agriculture. And so imagine the cultural differences, not to mention all the, for she grew up knowing everybody, everyone knows everybody. And now she's in a place where every, strange, every face is a strange face. And yet those faces are important faces that she has to get to know and interact with. And here in Medina, there are also about to become even more, uh, there's the weaning from safety is about to increase because not only now are we in sort of a war in the whole peninsula, but within Medina, we develop this, 
this this uh, group of hypocrites, those who you look at them and they act like, yeah, 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 I'm with you, but they're doing all sorts of things that are nefarious. And so imagine how we feel again when we find out about someone who is doing nefarious things, but acting as though they are a religious, uh, it, it, you know, following a religious path. And, you know, I know sometimes it could be a person who's sincere and they can make mistakes. So we really have to recognize that. Sometimes this, nef this nefarious, these things, it's just hypocrisy. It's just plain out using the religious role to gain access to uh, whatever sin they want to commit. So Fatima Rejilahana was in, deep in this place where there were those who were hypocrites, those who were straight up enemies in the area, the, around the area there were enemies. So again, she's weaned from this safety, weaned from her home weaned from the food and just ways of being smells that she was used to the, the smell you smell in the morning in mecca is different than the smell you smell in the morning in medina and, and i'm not talking about now which is different i'm talking about back then and so all of this now her sisters before oh, before medina her sisters went off to abyssinia so she was weaned from that sisterly connection her older sisters and her mother died so she's weaned from her mother She's weaned from her older sisters. All of this, what we would really label as heavy grief, heavy stress situations, so much stress. I mean, think about this. If, if you look at the sort of levels of stress that our modern therapists put out, all of these are there in the top 10. Moving, losing someone to death, uh, safety or war issues, et cetera, et cetera. They're all right there at the top. So she lost, loses her mother. Now she comes to Medina. She's going to lose another sister now to death here. And she had to leave another sister behind in, Me in Mecca. So she's far away from one sister who's, who she's worried about. She knows that she's a Muslim. She's centered in the, um, in the, the space of non-Muslims. She's worried about her. Her other sister is here in Medina, Ruqayya, and she dies in year two in Badr. When does she die? in the middle of the first real war. So now she's weaning, how much weaning is that? In Uhud, in Uhud, she's told, she, they all thought her father had died for a period of time. And so in Uhud, she's also weaned from the expectation of assuming that how long her father will live. Ya Allah, again and again and again, in, when she gets married, she's weaned from the, the, Maybe, maybe she had it, maybe she didn't. But many young girls who, when they're going to get married, they sort of think about what their household, household will be like. And maybe she imagined, I mean, there were all different economies back then, including of the very, 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 very good companions who had more money. She may have, I'm not saying she did because we don't have narrations about this, okay? But I'm just, I'm doing like some personal projecting. She may have imagined what her lifestyle might have been like. Maybe she would have imagined that it would have been a little bit easier or something but it was not only was it not it was it became more difficult let me just put turn the lights on suddenly all, it seems like all the lights went off um instead it became more difficult and she entered into this marriage with of, of poverty real poverty and hard work and we have narrations about how she, the work was so much that she and her mother-in-law divided it up now, when I tell that story in the companions class, I really point out how we learn about in-law in, in, in uh, relationships there. But here I want to point out something else. The work was so much that they were dividing up that work. And they were, they were working to daily. And, and it was hard. Like they didn't have servants. We say, oh, who has a servant? They didn't live like we live today. It was something normal to have servants around to help. This is a part, part and parcel part and parcel of the culture. And when Ali radiallahu an said this, he's, he knew that there was possible possibility to ask for a servant. He went to the Prophet and asked for one. And the Prophet sallallahu though his daughter is an adult, he's still upbringing her. And he says, no. Weaning her even from that help. Of course, we know that what he gave her instead is the place that she was never weaned from, which is the complete reliance upon Allah. All of that weaning that happened to her, all of it that happened to her, she was never weaned, not even in the slightest, 
from a from full dependence and reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The absence of dependence on other things other than Allah. Does that make sense the way I said that? Uh -huh. So if, uh, if we are if we no longer are dependent on other things, we can be dependent on Allah. But how can we be dependent on Allah? When we are dependent on other things, we say it 17 times a day if we're just praying the Fatul. We are claiming full dependence. We're claiming that we rely on Allah, that we seek help from Allah, that we worship Allah. But how many other things are we dependent on today that are actually getting in the way? And Ramadan comes as a way to remind us, don't be dependent on eating. Don't be, don't be, don't get hangry. We even have a word for this. Don't be hangry. Don't be dependent on eating. Don't be dependent on caffeine. Everybody knows me as a big coffee and caffeine person. And I certainly am. And I wish I could say that Ramadan cures me of that. I'm going to try it again like this. I feel like the lighting is so bad. Is it bothering you or is it fine? No, sometimes it goes in and out. It's just what it looks like, but it's fine. It's fine. Okay. I'll stop worrying about it then. So, um, but I mean, and I am like, I'll, I begin uh, Ramadan drinking coffee and I end Ramadan drinking coffee. I never do the thing that people talk about, about I'm not going to drink coffee in Ramadan. No, I just drink coffee all Ramadan, of course, at night, not in the day. But, um, so, but, but yet we are weaned from needing it to do our work. We have to go to work without caffeine. We have to all, we are, we, Ramadan weans us from dependency dependencies, physical dependencies, which we, if we are needing those to live our life, then how can we depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Islam comes, it teaches us habits. It's so interesting. Islam teaches us habits. You have to pray five times a day. You have to fast one whole month of every single year. You have to, uh, have, once a year, figure out your money and pay zakat. You, uh, what other habits? We have so many habits, the little habits that we're taught that we have to learn. But we're never allowed to get dependent on routine. It's a mind blowing thing for someone like me. I'm very much attached to routine. But we're not allowed to be dependent on routine. The prayer has to be a prayer, not a routine. Mm. It's not a, it's not a, I just need my yoga in the morning moment. Because in the winter time, you're doing that at 7 a.m. in Minnesota. And in the summertime, you're doing it at 3 a.m. And so that is going to mess up your routine. <laughs> you're not, it's going to turn it all the way upside down. You cannot be reliant on a routine. You have to rely on the prayer and you have to be cre constantly creative in figuring out how am, I, how am I managing my intended worship? How am I managing my intended worship when I got to go to work in five minutes in, in January, let's say, and in the summer when I just went to sleep two hours ago, for example. And how are we managing that? So it's, Islam does this really, Islam, if I can personify it, does this really fascinating thing that it teaches, it instills habits, but removes dependency on routine. It gives us this amazing balance between the two. And we see this in Fatima. Uh, she lost all of these things. So she she never, she never, um, was dependent. She couldn't be dependent on any of them. She couldn't be dependent on parentage, on a mother, on a sister, on status, on home, on safety, on regular account, regular income, on any of these things. And even when she has children, those of you who had children really close together can relate to this. When she has children, she has them really close together. So you all know when you have young children, you also are weaned from your own time. You don't get to do what you want to do when you want to do it anymore. And the more little ones you have, the more intense that is until they start to grow up a little bit and start to help you. And then you can give them some jobs to do and just take five minutes here and there. But so she was even weaned as well from the thing that so many women are weaned from always and all times, which is her time belonging to her. They were all little at the same time. SubhanAllah. And so we see all of these things, but she was never, ever weaned from dependency on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Where, what's the secret? Because there was love. 
because there was love. She was not ever restrained in love. And when, and love is the one thing we don't want to be restrained in. And because when we have, when love grows, and this is what made her the greatest of women, in my opinion. When love grows, when we have real love for Rasulullah Sallallahu for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, for our Deen, for one another, for our sisters and brothers in faith, even the ones who annoy you, even the ones who know, when we have real love for all of this, then then we are that love, that that love. Okay, let's let's back it up. Let's talk about if you love something. Okay, let's say you love Apple products. We'll talk about something really shallow. You love apple products or some some other thing. Let's say or some kind of chocolate, what have you. Uh, what happens to people when apple products come out with a new product? They're like sitting at their at that computer. Yeah, they're running there. They're sitting there. How can I order this? I want to get this. They're not thinking, how am I going to pay for it? They're you know there there's a new apple card now, so people can do it without interest. It's like they thought, oh, we need more Muslims to buy this stuff, and they're. You know, now I can pay payments without interest at the same price. And people are jumping and running to get that. And I mean, that's, I'm not criticizing that. I want to examine love. I want to examine love. This is love for a thing. And I think we get dependent on those things. That love for that thing, we become dependent on that thing because we love it. And then that can become, that becomes a problem for us because we, if we are forced to be restrained from it for any reason, it could mess up our ability to live our life. When we talk about love for a human being, okay, whether it's a spouse or a child or a parent or a friend, when that we really, really like, let's talk about it for a newborn baby because that's a love that is probably the purest, I would say, the one with the least nefs. So the love, and, and I think that that love for a newborn baby is not, I, I know that we always like to talk about a mother's love for a newborn baby, but I would say anyone, a mother, a father, an aunt, an uncle for a newborn baby, everyone is going to respond the same when that baby goes, ah, they're going to jump. They're going to, I mean, if you know someone else is taking care of the baby, if you got three of you there, you may sort of say, oh, she's, the mother's getting up. But if you told mom, I'm going to take care of the baby, you're at the edge of your seat. You want to jump up and take care of that baby. This is a love for a, a baby is a love that gives us the ability to set aside our comfort, to set aside our comfort zone and truly do things outside of what would be normal for us. Now, in our world, newborn babies start to grow up. And so that love, I mean, that love continues with the adults in their life. But of course, it changes. There's some changes that happen there um, because we want to upbring those children. We want to teach them how to rely on themselves. And it's no longer love to jump every time they say they need something. We want them to learn how to walk and move and this and that. But that moment, that early moment of that kind of love, when we're fully setting aside our personal needs to jump to the need of a baby, is something in this love that I want to talk about today, or that I'm talking about here when I'm referring to Fatima Rizillah Anha. Because her love for her father, her love for the Prophet Sallallahu her love for Allah, Azzawajal, her love for deen, her love for the people of deen was greater, was, was not restrained. There was, we don't see restraint in that love. And just like the love of an infant, when it's not restrained, it lets us set aside all of our comfort and we move beyond it to work. That's how she lived her life. She moved beyond her comfort zone and she lived her life without there she didn't have dependencies on anything the one thing, place we see her in only one place where we might we look upon that and that's when her father calls her and she cries he whispers to her and she cries then he whispers to her and she smiles and like has a light I don't like the word laugh because when we say laugh in English we, we mean something funny but she has like a pleasurable uh, response, a vocal pleasurable response. And they asked her later, what was that? And she said that when she cried, it was because her father told her he was dying. He was going to die. And there she was being weaned now from the worldly aspect of her father. Now, Allah, and she cried. 
And we see that one place where the, the, the love of the human being, of her, of her father, who is the Prophet, so I send them both, is painful. It's painful to, to grieve. His, his, his upcoming, his death, and then after he dies, it is said that she didn't smile again until her death. And when she smiled, and when the person was speaking to her, it was because he told her that she would be the first to follow him. Now that is also, what is the last thing she's being weaned of? Life itself. Life itself. And choosing and being happy when the, her strong, clear, certain, absolute, without doubt, belief, knowledge, and absolute certainty that there is and will be and she awaits the next life. That is what there was no restraint in. Now when we look at our life, we can look at Fatima, right? let's just take a moment and think about that restraint and how it applies in our own life and how we can define it for ourselves. The ability to live your life even when you're stripped of the ease you are accustomed to, even when you're stripped of the comfort pieces you set for yourself, the ability to live your life. What does it mean to live your life? Now, I want to redefine that because live your life means many things to many people. To live your best life, to live your goals, to live the goal of reaching Allah. Now, that when we look at Fatima and look at how she interacted with her life, we recognize this is not some kind of um, imagine sitting at top of a hill somewhere in uh, you know worship. Bismillah, Bismillah, Bismillah. No, this is a person who is able to, in stripping herself of comforts or having been stripped of them, she isn't stressed. There is no anxiety. She is not upset about it. We don't see her even. The only one we see her grieving is her father. And for this, we say, Rasulullah, it, it, it should be grieved. The, 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 we don't see that it affects, there's nothing at all called hangry and all this other kind of stuff that we have today. But rather, she's able to not just live her life like, okay, I can manage, I can do it. No. Fully live her life for Allah. Fully live her life with joy. With the joy of what is the most important thing on this earth, which is dependence sorry, most important thing on this earth, which is the, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is, that is grounded in knowing that our true dependence is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our true and absolute dependence is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jalla jalala. Now, when we take apart these different qualities of hers and we say, okay, she was, she was a hero. Yeah, because how can you be a hero? You have to forget about other things around you. MashaAllah, the person that got the award for us is Suhaib Sultan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate his rank. Ya Allah, may Allah <laughs> elevate his rank. And we were so happy that he, he knew we got it. Just right before he slipped into a coma. <laughs> but why hero? Why is he here? Now mind you, other people nominated people. I wish we could take credit for the nominations as well. But, but because of this is exactly what he's doing. He is, how much did he teach us? He was living his life for Allah, even as he was weaned of health, even as he was weaned of physical strength, even as he was weaned of his hopes for his family, even as he was weaned of his, of his um, uh, vision of what it meant to be a chaplain at a university. He didn't quit any of that, any of it at all. In fact, I, I, without giving too much detail because I want to honor his um, amana, but he, he requested from somebody something for his daughter's hajj. His daughter's only like, I don't know how old she is now, six or seven. Like he's thinking in the future about his daughter's hajj. And he, isn't this a hero? This is a hero, not the Marvel people who, you know, all of that. This is, this is a hero. This teaches us. This is Fatima. This is Fatima, the, the, the footsteps of Fatima, I love on her. And it's so nice to put that um, focus, that microscope, if you will, on the one quality, because that helps us, again, plump out who she was. And then for us, it helps us follow in the footsteps as well. 
So we can say, okay, do I need to be a hero right now? In whatever situation I'm in, do I need to be a hero right now? Do I need to act like a hero right now? And then if we think about her as of just a couple of them I want to mention, as a dakirat, as a person, a woman of dikir. You know, dikir, which is the uh, one of the types of prayer in Islam. We have three types of prayer. Not to get too basic on you, but let's just, we have three types of prayer. Salat, which is our ritual prayer. We all, okay. Dua, which is talking to God. And dhikr, which is the meditative repetition of God's names or the glorifying of Allah or in any different way of re repeating the names of God in a meditative way. Now, for many years, that's kind of, for many years in my, when I first became Muslim, that was so out of style. It was like, you, you are be careful about using that word in a public place. But historically, one of the ways that Islam was able to spread is through dhikr practices. Why? Because, hello, any convert that's listening, or actually non-Arabic speaker, you're going to really relate to this. When you go as a new Muslim or as a non-Arabic speaker to the Qur'an, the Qur'an is full of miracles, and it will fill you, even if you don't understand a word. It will give you light, even if you don't understand it. It will uplift you if you don't understand it. But there also is something missing when you're not understanding. Just to imagine, I used to be so jealous. I used to burn with jealousy to think of that Arab woman over there, whoever it was, you know, who could say Allahu Akbar and literally understand every word she's saying. And I was par often in the early days parroting something I didn't understand at all. And just not to say that, that we still have to do it and it, and it gives us light and it uplifts us, but there is a difference. So what happened is in, those, in the early spreading of Islam, and uh, some of the early, mashallah, the intelligence of our early founders, they realized that something like the Fatimiyyah, the Tasbihah, because you can learn one and know what it means, subhanallah, 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 subhanallah. Subhanallah. And when you meditate on something, you're, the meaning also grows in you. It becomes a word you own. This is, forgive me for this little bit of a digression in education, but I've been, I taught language for many years. When I lived in Syria, among the many other things I was doing, I was also a language teacher and a language curriculum writer. And one of the things that was, is the goal of language teaching is to help your language learner own a word. So the way you do that is you help move them through understanding the word through translation or explanation into being able to use the word naturally. In fact, a lot of theory says you shouldn't translate because when you translate, you deprive a student of owning the word. There's, there's a lot of controversy on that, so don't take that as truth. I'm just saying that there's that discussion. Now, uh, so when we look at these phrases of praise and we think about how they're meditatively repeated, and <clears throat> we think about all the non-Arabic speakers who have been blessed to have Islam gifted to them, the, the repetition of subhanAllah, 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 eventually you own it. You own it. You don't have to think what does it mean. In fact, the translation suddenly feels distant and not accurate. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allah. This kind of repetition is meditative and it changes your heart and it helps you grow. And as, it was, as Islam spread, this is one of the ways that new Muslims were able to access the enormous, thick, rich spirituality of our faith as they were on the path to learn uh, Arabic so that they could also access the enormous spirituality of the Quran and ritual prayer and, and etc. So Fatima is one of our earliest teachers really of this concept because she teaches us that in the repetition of these phrases you are changed. The Prophet I mean, think about this, told her this would be, re this was a replacement 
for a ser for a servant's helper with her work. What does that tell us about the effect of the care on our lives? It's not just an effect on our heart. It's an effect on our whole life. The, the ability to have barakah or blessing in our time. The ability to get our work done. The ability to fulfill our own personal goals. The ability to connect and have a sense of dependency in the right place on Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalala. So her as a dhakirat, when we look at her like this and we see her devotion to it, Ali radiallahu anhu says she never left it. They never left it to the end of their lives. So uh, when we see her devotion to this, mashallah, talk about widowed every day. Who, who, who is a person who has tried to have a widowed has had a day, has never missed a day? Astaghfirullah. Not me. May Allah forgive me. I wish I could claim such a, such, such, I wish I could claim such a claim and I would be a better person today if I could. And so do you mind telling that story just in case people don't know the exact word that the Rasul gave to them to repeat yeah. when they asked for? There's some different narrations of the story, but in general, the, the story is that um, the work is very difficult for, for them. And Fatima radiallahu anha, was, she had blisters on her hands. Um, and I imagine the, her, her physical body showed the the uh what's the word that you use the um manifestations manifestations of the work yeah exactly in many different ways the blisters on her hands and and her aches and pains and just the exhaustion of it and so um ali radiallahu an, told her go and ask your father for a servant to come to us and they couldn't really afford one but they thought he might send them someone to uh, work for them, to serve them. And um, so they go back and forth on that a little bit. And then finally, so the request comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And he says, let me give you something better than that. And that's the, that's the thing. Let me give you something better than that. And it, I mean, as a person who for many, many years has definitely needed help in the house. I mean, you there's a lot of work to do in the work that I do. And they're always, I've always had two or three or four, ask my kids, they'll say seven or eight different jobs I'm trying to get done. So I've always needed help in the house. I couldn't always have it. I couldn't always have it. But I mean, boy, it's a big difference when you have it. And when I hear that from the Prophet, I said, let me give you something better than that. It puts me, it puts me to shame of my dunya eyes. Like, how can I see this dunya as so controlled by this dunya. Where are my akhira glasses? Where are my akhira eyes? Where I can know that there are other elements affecting this world. And so he gave her this tasbih. He said, say, so the, the different narrations differ a little bit on how many times he told her to say it and when and all of this. But to say, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, one narration, Allahu Akbar, after each of her prayers, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, na ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, another narration. After uh, each, 33 times after each of her prayers is most of the narration, most of the agreement there, but um, or in the morning and in the evening, and it's different. The scholars have been very flexible about timings. The Quran speaks a lot about the kid in the morning and in the evening, so that's also those are times of what we call wudids or regular practice of the kid. And but this was to make easier for her her work, subhanallah. Like, it's just, um, so when I, I always think about that, and when I think about, like, Salat al-Tasabih, which I don't know if your listeners are familiar, this is a prayer where you can say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, in the prayer. Uh, I think it's 370 times. And it's, it's, like, broken up into the different movements of the prayer. I always think of that prayer as a strengthening prayer, a prayer that gives strength and health to the physical body. Even when you're tired, even when you're exhausted. I remember when I was nine months pregnant with my son and I was praying that prayer and somebody caught me praying it. I think probably Ansi is my son. And she said, who's my sister-in-law? So I don't want anyone to think like someone's like coming into my house or something. Like that. <laughs> it wasn't my sister-in-law, okay. Um, and uh, she made some comments about, uh, okay, context. My stomach was like as big as 16 elephants. All right, like I'm enormous. She made some comments about uh, it's, um, it's some kind comments about be good to yourself or sit down. I can't remember what it was exactly. I just remember thinking when she said that, 
how much this prayer gives strength and how I really relate that to this narration with the with Fatima that these phrases of praise give physical strength to the human being. And that's part of the, the miracle, of course, of, of all of this beautiful religion, but it's part of the miracle of what we learn from Fatima. Because if she is weaning or restrained, she doesn't get to have the sort of help of the dunya. She gets something much better. And this is what we have to fix our understanding. She gets something much better, which is help from the spiritual world, which who even knows what that means fully. Like nobody knows that means fully. She gets that help. And so, subhanAllah, uh, Fatima, radiallahu anha, Fatima Zahra, is a, there are a lot of lessons for us in Ramadan, especially as we are deprived of food and drink in the day, as we are also deprived of sleep. We're not getting as much sleep as we usually get, as we are deprived of our routine. Our routine is all off. Everyone's routine is a mess. I think by the end of Ramadan, what I hear people say the most is, I'm looking forward to getting back to routine. So when you start saying that, pause for a minute and say, wait a minute, why? Why am I looking forward to getting back to routine? Now, there's nothing sort of like un-Islamic about routine. As I said, Islam teaches us habits. But we shouldn't be dependent on routine to live our life for Allah. So even as we create, I personally am a person who craves routine. So I just want to be clear about that. I'm not like, I, I love routine and I will eat the same thing for breakfast for six months. No problem at all. Like, I'm, I really, routine is, is right up my Greek, right up my alley. But um, but nonetheless, it's really important, especially maybe for someone like me, maybe more important for someone like me to stop and say, wait, what am I craving about routine? And I need to learn how to do things no matter the circumstances, even if there's a death, even if there's something I'm grieving, even if I'm moving, even if I have something new, even if something has been taken away from me, even if the thing I'm, I'm attached to, I no longer have access to whatever that is, so that I can rid myself of all these attachments and be attached only to Allah. And that is the, the, the point I really want to bring home. If there's a take home here, it's that while she was weaned from all of these things, it was her love, this great love for the Prophet, love for Allah. She wasn't restrained in love. And because of that, the love itself allowed the restraint. That's, that's the take home. When we are not restrained in love for Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu by itself, that gives us ease and restraint. We're okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean we don't grieve. And I always want to say this, like, it's not like we can't have feelings or emotions. Grief is normal. I, I personally, I, I, grief is my friend. I think that grief is something that helps us love. And I'm, you see that I've been put posting stuff on my Instagram about Sham. It's actually been a lot of work for me to get to that place where I can talk about my life there again and I and hold my grief in a place where I can think about it and talk about it because it's really painful for me to remember those days because of how much I loved them not because of anything else and how much I miss them and, but I think it's really it's an, it's an important exercise so I'm, I'm doing it actually quite on purpose to to be able to have a, to bring that grief forward and not just to hide it somewhere. I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to, I want that grief and that love to be part of my life. I don't want it to be hidden away because I'm afraid of that pain or anything, you know? So love, this is the takeaway, everybody. Love allows restraint. When you truly love the prophet, when you truly love Allah, Azza wa Jal, when you truly love this religion, you truly love the people of this religion, you will find restraint and weaning of those of the things of this life easier because the love is bigger. And to walk in the footsteps of Fatima to be a positive cultural change agent is to really learn how to walk in that love, that enormous love, and, and be okay with the, the things in this life that sometimes we label as trials, but you know what? They might not be. They might just be being, we might just be living, that's just life, living life and, and uh, having that restraint so that we can really love and not be dependent on anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do we cultivate that love, Anse? If we're having difficulty with that, how do we start to cultivate that love? Well, I mean, love is... Um, So love is an emotion. We all know this. 
but it's also a verb. Love is an actual verb. And so I think that we have to take both of these into account and live accordingly. So regarding it being a verb, the more we act like we love the Prophet, the more we act like we love Allah, even when we're not feeling it, the more we act like we love Islam, the more we act like we love the Muslims, all of the Muslims, even the ones who annoy us, the, the more we act like that, the more our heart will grow in capacity and be able to love. On the side of that love is indeed an emotion, there are, what do we love? Like, you have to think about what do you love? There's a little bit of self-knowledge here. I've actually, ever since the book Project Lena, people have been talking to me about how, you know, that first module is really important for everyone. <clears throat> the first module is knowing yourself and just knowing who you are and coming to Allah in that way. And I've been thinking about that a lot. And I've been, in fact, somebody uh, called me the other day and said, you need to write a book like this for non-verts, the people who are not converts. And, and I mean, I'm just, I, so I, it's on my mind, this idea, but what, it's very important to understand who you love. Who do you love? Every, you, who you love is going to be different than who I love or what you love in someone. I'm talking about people of Jinnya now, of Jinnya. It may be different, maybe the way you love. You know, there's all this stuff about love languages and everything else. These are all tools that we can use to examine love for ourselves. And once you understand love for yourself, you're not going to get anywhere unless you have some understanding first. Then you can follow in the, the tools that you need to increase your love for the Prophet and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for this religion, for this ummah. And so those are going to be many different things for different people. For some people, it's going to be learning more. For some people, it's going to be more ibadah. Everybody needs both of those. For some people, it's going to be more sadaqah. I mean, there, there are some, types, some people, it's going to be really specific things. Other people, it's going to be maybe more da'a. Like, there's, it's, there will be some difference. I think it's really critical that we really reflect and think about what's important. What do I need? What, what, how do I love so that I can become a, a lover of the only one worthy of that love? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, of course, those who he loves. And we want to love Allah, we want to love those who he loves, we want to love the deeds that he loves and the people that he loves. All of this will put us in that love pool. Abby. Love ocean. Oh, so beautiful. I know we're up at time, but this is just such a beautiful example of the way in which I've learned from you over all these years. It's just so different than anything I ever learned growing up. I, I wish when I was 10 years old in Sunday school, my teachers, God bless them, but they were telling me to just increase your love is the answer. Like I, I wish that that was, you know, kind of the, the discourse, but this is, it. it's truly so transformative what you're saying. And, you know, to think through how to decrease yourself from that restraint and increase yourself in this love it not only is it logical, but it's it's felt. You, you know it because you've felt it before, and it feels just so right. So, and say the reason I get so emotional is because when somebody increases your love for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you can't help but love them. And I love you so much for what you how you given me so much love in my heart for the Rasulullah for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for our Deen and really put me on that path to having that love in my heart and I wouldn't be here without you. So I'm so, so forever indebted to you, Wallahi. Um, I would love for you to tell us about Rabata, everything you have going on, where we can donate, how we can get involved. We want to learn much more about everything that you're doing. Yeah, so I think in a nutshell, I shall tell it to you like this. I went over to my mom's house this morning. So I'm a neighbor with my mom, okay? We share a wall, like a real neighbor. Wow. Okay. <laughs> And my mom's husband is not my dad, right? He's a, I have, my dad is here, but he's not my dad. And um, he's a really, really, really wonderful man. And I walked over there just to say hi to my mom. And he walked up from the basement and he said, hey, aren't you going to tell us to donate? It's Ramadan. <laughs> I love it. I, 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 I really love it too. I was actually really touched. So what I learned, I learned something from that today, which is that people want to be, Theme. They want to be reminded of come on and donate. So yes, you can donate to Rabata along with my mother and her husband um, at Rabata, at launchgood.com forward slash Rabata. So we have a launch good going on. We really appreciate your donations and what you support. So what is Rabata? What you support 
we have that positive cultural change agent. We're trying to fill the world, rising tide of positive cultural change agents. Those people that are living the lives of these companions. And the way we do that is we have online academic programming. Did you see this year that we started Robotines and Dragonflies? It's so incredible. I got the newsletter too. I'm just, my, I like can't wait to inshallah have kids one day so that they can grow up and be Robotines. And, and <laughs> it's so exciting. It's amazing. It's super exciting, especially the robot teens classes. We really focus on helping them with adulting skills because a lot of our teens, they're not getting that in just the way that the educational system is set up. And so they're, it's, it's been really fun. They really enjoyed it. They said, we want a worship hour. Give us a worship hour. It's so, I love it so much. Mashallah, mashallah. And we also, we do publishing and that's really important. And any of you who have kids in school, I want to tell you something. Listen to this, please. Your children in school, if they're in public school or charter school or anything, they are being taught how to read, okay? And in being taught how to read, they are given books from the library. The 98% of those books either don't have representation of Muslim characters or the representation of Muslim characters is negative and either it's very stereotypical, as in they're like terrorists, or worse than that, in the plot, the problem is their religion that they have to get over. One of the most famous books that's out there, the, the young Muslim kid, in order to be successful, she has to pretend she's a boy in her culture. So like, it's really hard on our little, the little hearts of our children. So I want you to be aware of what your kids are reading, maybe read with them, so at least you can talk about it. But also supplements, get them some other books and we are a publishing company we have three novels so far uh oh that i i made it score uh, novels and other books and the novels are meant for young people who are reading anyway to read and see themselves and they're actually not necessarily about being muslim but the muslim characters in their living a muslim life we have sophie's journal pieces and acquaintance and oh and then drummer girl is the children's book so that's another yeah and then of course we have other books too so you can check us out at the website but I want you to think about that as parents. Crowning Ventures for you, if you're memorizing the Quran or thinking about that, you want to look at that one. My book is Joy Dots, and my new book is Project Lena, Bringing Your Whole Self to Islam. And of course, I also worked in, uh, with my amazing translation team for translating as a Sunnis book, Rahmatullah You can read about that on my Instagram page. I was, I've been writing about her. And there's a chapter about that and about her in Joy Dots as well. I've been really missing her this month because she died um, last year at this time. SubhanAllah. Um, we have a Revolta Masjid. It's really important for women because it's the coolest thing ever. We actually started it last year. I bet you don't know this story. Uh, that We started this last year in Ramadan because it was COVID and we wanted people to have a place to worship together, even though they're apart. And it was really, everyone was really excited about it and they came to it. And the end of Ramadan, we're like, okay, what do we do now? And Aunt Saridana, who's one of our instructors at Rebat, she said, what do you mean, what do you do now? A masjid that is open should never be closed. <sighs> right? I love that. Right? I we love do. that. So we, we have a fully volunteer team, and they work, I can't tell you how hard, to keep it safe. Because, you know, we have, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, like the whole world of Zoom bombers, alhamdulillah, we have it. But it's not, we haven't had to deal with it because we, we're super careful. Because it's a place of worship. Like, we don't want that, you know. Anyway, so we have that. We have lots of activities going on there. We did a really fun thing last year. I, I'm talking too much, I know. No, but not at all. Time where we talked about Mary, Maryam, uh, the mother of Jesus. And it was for converts to invite their parents to. Oh, that's so beautiful. It was so amazing. And, of course, anybody could come to you. But, like, that was a real opportunity to do something that would feel a little bit Christmassy. But at the same time, acknowledge that the child is a Muslim. You know, it's really fun. So we do so many things and you can read about us on our website. I don't want to take up too much time. I can, you opened up a topic. I don't stop talking about it. You give me the opportunity. But definitely check out our, the winners. I definitely want everyone to go to the website, check out the winners who the people have won. I, I mentioned Suhaib Sultan. Also the pearls they won for Zakirat, since I talked about Zakirat. The, the amazing uh, Sakina Radia. Uh, from the UK, they won for that get out. They're so helpful. The other day, can I just tell one more quick? Of one? course, the floor is yours. Let's open the center here in Minnesota. I'm so excited about it. I can't wait till COVID is over and people can come here. But we have 3,900 square feet, mashallah. Wow. So 
Yes, I know. I'm so excited. We have classrooms. Oh, we've got right now we have a pop up nested. Oh. So for our Sarawia, when they come, I, I don't have anyone who knows how to sing and I don't know how to sing. So <laughs> I've been like, you know, we sing together, which is really fun. But I have a djembe and I love the djembe drum. I love it, love it, love it. And I, I thought, okay, nobody else can do it. I'll just figure it out. And I called Sakina of the Pearls and I said, help me. So she sent me. I, I took lessons from her before. So I, it's not that I. Not on cold, like I have taken lessons from how to play before. I said, send me a couple of the beats so we can do La ilaha illallah together in this sort of tradition of finding that spirituality, even as we're learning. A lot of people who are coming are converts and such. And um, and she's, she's amazing. She sent me three different ways I could possibly do it over WhatsApp, and I practiced them. And now we added the jambe to I our love show. it. Nice. That's <laughs> amazing. I can't wait to come visit, inshallah, once it's open. I oh, cannot wait. But as soon as the rest of the world is open, you mean? Yes. Inshallah. 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 That's incredible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless all of the work that you're doing and illuminate the path for all of us towards loving him and increasing ourselves and our own love for our deen and his beauty. And it's just, subhanAllah, I, I still remember signing up for Ravatha when it was like a seedling of, a, of an idea. Yeah. And to see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken it and all the work that you're doing and just spread it in the way that it is, is just truly a testament to how important the work is. I also remember, I don't know, like, historically the timeline when this is, but I remember you and Beit Salman saying to me, you know, I'm going to leave law. <laughs> open a business for hijab what do you think and I'm like I mean first of all I'm now like I now after all these years of training and I've been studying nonprofit and business and stuff I might be able to give you a better answer but I mean I don't even know what I said but I remember but I remember that and I remember thinking wow mashallah like I don't know anything about business so but look I at you look at you you've made hijab cool oh oh May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make hijab so beautiful for every woman who wants to wear it. But I don't even remember doing that. That's so funny I did that. I had courage in those days. I was so intimidated just to even look at you. That's so funny I did that. Yes. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, I'm glad I did. Because I think I asked Zainab. I don't know Zainab, if you remember. I said, is she going to be okay? Like, she's, <laughs> and she's like, she's brilliant. She'll be fine. So... Oh my goodness, subhanAllah, that's so funny. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, kul shi b'khair. And so do you mind closing us out with a dua? La Rahman Rahim, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, accept our fasting, accept our prayers. Ya Allah, accept our sadaqah, accept our Quran reading. Ya Allah, accept our Ramadan and make us of those who live lives that reflect the lives of the companions of the Prophet that walk in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allahumma ahdina wa ahdibina al-ibad al-bilad. Guide us and guide through us lands and people. Open doors for us. Bless us. Forgive us. Guide us. And make us of those with whom you are pleased. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad. In Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Aliki ya umid bin iyaaka al-abadu wa iyaaka al-salam. Sirat al-Mustaqeen. Sirat al-Mustaqeen. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد